Pew Bible, the page number is 151. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules, that the Lord our, your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commands, which I commanded you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Lord, or Israel, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Thank you, Cade. Like I said, you're going to be sick of me by the end of the day, so you'll be like, where is Pastor Mark? Um, oh, my hero. Look at this. My guy. Appreciate it. I should have planned that before. So we're in Deuteronomy 6. I don't know about you. I love stories. I love stories. I love telling stories. Uh, I'm the son of a storyteller. Like, if you want to know, if you're like, I'm in the mood for a story, and you can find my dad and say, just tell me a story, he can tell you one. He, it may not be real, but he'll tell you one. <laughs> I, but I'm the same. I love telling stories. Every, every night, uh, whenever I put my son Sam to bed, uh, when he finally will stay in bed, is after I tell him a story. Sam is... Two and a half, or a little over two and a half. He turns three in July. But he, he does this thing where I will bring him into his bedroom. He lays down in his big boy bed, and he pulls the covers up all the way to his chin. And he says, Dad, will you snuggle with me? Now, I don't know if you understand the word, what snuggle means. But to a two-year-old boy, that means, do you want to get into the bed and let's fight until I'm wore out? And so... I, I, I will get into bed with him, and he immediately, it's kicking and punching, and I'm like, buddy, we got to stop, all right? So he will, he'll, I will cocoon him in with those blankets, and then he'll ask me, he'll go, Dad, can you tell me a story? And I go, yes, I can. And I started every, every, the same way every time. There once was a little boy, and his name was, and I let him finish it, and he'll go, Sam, Sam. And he gets so excited about it. Now, depending on the, like, the day, there are times where I'll tell him an elaborate story or this story of the day, what we did that day. We'll talk about how God did something fun in our lives that day, um, whatever. But then there's times where I'm really tired, and I'll just tell him a quick story. Because I believe every good story just has a problem and a resolution. And so I will literally tell him, once upon a time there was a little boy named Sam Sam, and, and then I'll go, and he was really tired, and he couldn't find his bed. Then he did. Then he went to sleep. The end. <laughs> I think it's a good story. And apparently so does he, because he's done. But then he wants to tell me a story. He'll go, can I tell you a story? And I go, yes. And he goes, once upon a time there was a big bad wolf and at this point he's waiting for me to react so I will react ah, you know something of the of the kind wake everybody else up in the house and then he goes and then he goes like he starts over once upon a time there was a big bad yeti and then I have to freak out and then he goes and they all lived happily ever after the end <laughs> I'm like what a story man you're getting it so I love sharing stories, and I love hearing stories. I love reading. I love history because of that. In fact, like, 
if I ever go out to lunch with you, there, there's times I, I want to be so invested in the stories you tell. I love your stories. I, I love hearing about when people come to know the Lord. It's one of my favorite things because it's the turning point of someone's life. It's fascinating. And, I, and, and the other thing is the amount of wisdom that I get to hear from people when I just listen to their stories and ask them questions about it. It's, it's so much fun for me. I go so far as to think when I see an older individual pass away, I think the amount of wisdom that we just lost out on. I love stories. I learn from stories, and if I listen to your stories, I would get to find out what you like to talk about, where you like to be, what you, where you spend your time. I get to find out what you think of God. I get to find out a lot of things by just listening to your story. The title here is You Have Something to Share. Every single one of us in here has a story. Some of, some of our stories don't have Jesus in them, and I want to talk about him with you today. Some of you in here have stories of Jesus and how he changed your life. And in the midst of that, you see trials and issues and your failings in the faithfulness of God. Do you know that in the book of Genesis, when God sets a covenant with Abraham, he says a line, he's, and God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you may be a blessing. It's not just for me. You have something to share. And I believe in the book of Deuteronomy, it's commanded that we have something to share and that we share it. And if you're like sitting here going, but the book of Deuteronomy, it's Old Testament. This book was, like this is Moses specifically talking to the Jews, the, the nation of Israel. How, what does this have to do with me? The beauty is all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, rebuke, and training in righteousness. All of it that we may be equipped for every good work. So Deuteronomy is part of that. The other thing, the, if you want to know validity and how Jesus used the book of Deuteronomy, in Luke 4, when he's to be tempted, he's led in the wilderness to be tempted, he's standing, he's with Satan, he's fasting for 40 days, and Satan comes in and he tempts him three times and the, to do something. And the three verses that he quotes, two of them are from Deuteronomy 6 and one from Deuteronomy 8. So your Savior even uses Deuteronomy in the, in the context of his life years later. I think we can do the same. So with that being said, I want to jump into this. And I want us to look at first our hearts. I've preached on Deuteronomy 6 before, and I looked it up. I was like, how long has it been? It's been, been here eight years, and it's been six years since I've preached on Deuteronomy 6. And I'm amazed at how much you can learn over the course of even like a year. Um, and so I wanted to revisit this as my wife and I had opportunity to go to what is called the D6 Family Conference, and it is based around Deuteronomy 6 and the idea of family discipleship. That it isn't, it isn't just... Um, we hope for a good return with our kids, but that we are investing in them the saving works of Jesus Christ so that it is, it is purposeful and intentional teaching to the next generation. And so I'm, I'm so thankful that this church allows us to do something like that so we can learn, grow, and then ultimately teach this, these principles as well. But point number one, I want to look at this, recount your history with God, you will notice like in these points, the, I, the, the word recount I chose purposefully because it is coming to mind in remembrance, but telling someone. Recount your history with God. In the book of Deuteronomy, we notice uh, the end of Moses' life. The, the nation of Israel is to the point where they're about to cross over to the promised land, or to start inheriting the promised land. And in this, up to this point, we, we see some things happen. We see the, 
disobedience of Israel. And at that point, when they disobey, at a certain point, God punishes the, a generation of Israelites that may not inherit the promised land. And that's given to the next generation, led by Joshua. Moses here is pleading to that generation. In fact, chapters 1, 2, and 3 are all following the history of them going into this promised land. We see, and he spells out their history, the history when they were disobedient, and the only people that thought that they could take a king was Caleb and Joshua. And it's funny because it's actually a beautiful story just because the, the faithfulness of God still is enacted in their disobedience. They still take the, the land. They still crossed through it. Although they were defeated for a time, they still got through it. Then, you see in chapter 3, when they obey, God uses them to wipe out another king to get even closer. And then we see in chapter 4, where we see this exhortation, this teaching moment from Moses to the Israelites. And we're going to look at chapter 4 as well today. Because he wants this generation to know that don't turn away from God the way that your fathers have done. Don't do that. Stay with him so that you may be prosperous and live long in the land. And so then we get to chapter 5. And chapter 5 is a, a redundant chapter in the sense that he speaks from Exodus 20 again, and shares the commandments of God that he was given on Mount Sinai. The history of Israel is displayed. And we see this, this history enacted even in our lives. So I, I want to look at this. We have all of this history that we have with God. Do you know, I love that the Bible is so beautiful in the fact that even the common grace that is given by God, that he reigns on the just and the unjust. What a beautiful love that God has for his creation. And yet, so often we can turn from him. But I want to look at this scripture so we have an understanding of where, we've, where, where we're at in Deuteronomy. Moses actually gives several sermons in the book of Deuteronomy and some prophetic poems. And he gets to this point where he says, verse number one, Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. So now he's transitioned. He's given all the commandments, and now he says, Now, you've heard all of that. Now I'm going to give you the greatest commandment. I'm going to give you the greatest commandment. What I love is Moses is, I, God has taught me to teach you. If, if there ever was like a foreshadow here, Jesus does this in Matthew 28. He does this in Matthew 28, where he talks about going into all nations, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he goes, teaching them all the things that I've commanded you. So Jesus, who taught his disciples, commands his disciples to teach others. Moses, if you, if you don't know, there's a lot of similarities between Christ's life and Moses' life. The difference is, is Moses was a sinner, still in need of a Savior, and Jesus was the Savior. And so here we, we get this role of Moses, and he says, he says I, God has commanded me to teach you, why? So that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it. And this is it. That you may fear the Lord your God. I've talked about this before, but this phrase, fear the Lord your God. Do you know that repeatedly in the Bible we are called to hold God in a reverent position? Exalted position. Not out of the, the lovey-dovey God that, that the world can sometimes, although I do believe God is love, I also believe 
God is God and is one to be feared. He created you and created me. And, and I, I thought about this the other day, that it's, a, it's the grace of God that I'm still breathing today. Which means he's got a greater purpose in my life, but it's not for me, it's for his glory. It is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. He's, he, so he's telling this generation, fear God. Put him in a place that he deserves. You want to know the commandment to where we can start is, is to understand God is God and we are not, and neither is his creation. He, is, he alone is God. We're going to look at that later. But that's where he starts. You and your son and your son's son. He goes on to talk about generational discipleship. That it's not just enough. So grandparents, I'm talking to you now. It's not just the parents that can teach the children. It's not just the parents that can share the stories to the children. But it's the grandparents that can share their stories to the grandchildren. It's not parenting them. It's not usurping the parent. It's that when you hang out with them, I'm so blessed to have my father and, and Pastor Mark and Kim as, as in-laws there. And they, but the grandparent influence is like that they share with my children. The, when I say that I'm the son of a storyteller, my father, he, he wasn't bashful about telling me stories of back in the day before he knew the Lord. In comparison to now, he would go, I, that doesn't matter. He knows the Lord now. This is way better. And he talks about it, but he, when he talks about these things growing up, it was always in an avenue to point to God. My mom was the same way. It was always in an avenue to point to God. He's the one who redeemed me. He's told me stories on how people have come up to him and said, one, I don't know how you're still alive. But two, you're different. You're not the same Gary Janes that I once knew. And he's like, well, I'm older. But God's done a work. It's all to his glory. I have those stories. And I'm watching not only I, my wife pour into my children in that way to fear God, but that my in-laws and my father are doing the same. Grandparents, you have a job that's just as important in sharing the gospel with your grandchildren. Just as important. This is a generational task, multi-generational task. He keeps going and says, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Isn't it, isn't it nice that God shares rules, commandments, all of these things? The book of Leviticus, um, that so many of these rules are just common sense rules. He's like, you want to live long? Don't do that. Like, that's just a simple thing. You want to prosper in the land? Obey me. I'm kind of wise on this one. The, the greatest hardships that they have is after they've been exiled due to their disobedience. I'm going through the book of Daniel with the teens on Sunday mornings, and, the, and Israel being exiled out, and an entire um, group of young people being pulled away from the Israelites to, to uh, the Chaldeans, who are teaching them something completely contrary. And yet, what's incredible is these young people are so resilient in their faith to God that he saves them time and time and time again. Their disobedience led them out of Israel and then into a fire. And we're going to see that in chapter 4 here in a second. But into a fire where they have to rely on Christ. Imagine with me if they just obeyed. They wouldn't have had to have been exiled. I know God has a purpose for a lot of things. But our, be, our obedience will save us from a lot of trouble. 
He ends this part of this passage. And he says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. This alludes to all the way back to Genesis when Abraham is, is, is talking to God and God gives him a covenant that says, I will multiply you into a great nation. And, he, and ultimately, I'm going to send you to a land that I will show you. Abraham never saw the promised land, but it came to fruition through his lineage. The beauty is that this is brought up because it's been passed down. The faithfulness of God has been passed down generation to generation to generation. Because they had something to share. I'm going to jump to point number two, recount your relationship with God. Now, verse four is interesting because it's called the Shema. The Shema itself um, basically means to hear. It's like a come, it's like, it's, it's when we get together, it's like uh, we, we would go with the kids uh, and say something like, uh, I, I say, I need, I need eyeballs. And they all like look at me with eyeballs. Some of them pretend to hand them to me downstairs. But it's like that, that it's, it's a call. But this, this phrase that they say has so much meaning and depth. And it's part of their history and their relationship with God. Look at this. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This has a lot of theological implications for us as well as them. This phrase, it, it, it shows unity. The Lord our God, so we serve one God in unity. So he's, this is the nation of Israel serving one God in unity. And it says the Lord is one. Why does this matter? Well, if the word Lord here is Jehovah or Yahweh, covenant keeper God. So this is it's his name and it says the Lord our God. And the word God is Elohim. Elohim we can go all the way back to Genesis when it says, uh, in the beginning, God, Elohim. The word Elohim is a plural term for a singular unit. This is where we see the Trinity. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God in full unity with each other. This phrase is also to highlight the fact that Israel struggled so hard with idolatry that it had to be reminded to them that the Lord is God, the God, and, and he's just one God. There's only one. All these others are false. And I thought, in our history with God and in our relationship with God, how often we can fall prey to idols in our life. Now, I want to look, let's jump to chapter 4, so just turn a page. This is, this is Moses talking about idolatry. He starts in, in verse 15, and he says, Therefore, because he's talking about obedience to God, but more so keeping him number one. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure. And then he goes through a list here. In the likeness of male or female, likeness of any animal that is on earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole of heaven. And then he, and then he shares his faithfulness. 
But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance as you are this day. And you may be like, I don't have any carved images. It's interesting because he talks about how because they couldn't see God and they just heard God, that that, even that was just enough for them to turn and go to idolatry. We do this today because we don't always see God. Our feelings get ahead of us. Our feelings are deceptive. And then when we think God's not working, we actually turn to something that's not Him. And we'll rest in whatever fulfillment that thing will bring us. I see it happening more and more today at the very end of the the last thing he mentions is astrology. I'm amazed at how many people that profess Christianity are like leaning on their sign. Guys, God created the stars. He didn't want you to rely on them. I'm seeing more and more Eastern mysticism and religions coming into the U.S. and a heavy leaning on them because it's this inner peace. It's this that can only be found in Christ. We look at Philippians 4, right? And a peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in who? Christ Jesus. And so many of us are leaning on a crystal for peace. Put it under your pillow. Put it on your chest. And I'm not trying to make fun of it. I'm trying to say it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You're leaning on an idol. This is what he's talking about. When, when the Israelites were scared at the bottom of the mountain, what did they do? When they got confused, they made an image and they worshipped an image. They forgot about God. It's so easy for us to do the same. In our trials, in our, in, in, when we're persecuted, when we're feeling down, when we don't feel God, it doesn't mean he's not there. Because Let's look at this. At the bottom of, of chapter 4, or starting in verse 25, here's what happens with idolatry. But I want you to see something that's really beautiful here. Chapter 4, verse 25. When, you're, when you father children... And children's children, and have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything, and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God, so as to provoke him to anger, that's, that's something to, to think about, that God's not quick to anger, but it's re- when people go, why, if, why, how do you believe in a God that would do that? Do you know we deserve so much punishment By the grace of God, he refrains a lot. He's very patient with us. It is not God just being angry. It is man provoking anger. Verse 26, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but be utterly destroyed. This idea of utterly destroyed is not to negate the, the promise that God has they made with Abraham. He was faithful to complete it. What this means is they, the utterly destroyed is the nation's going to be exiled. They're going to be split apart. He goes on to say, and the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. This is the result. I'm going to give you over to the desires of your heart. You wanted this. I'm going to give it to you. Check out this. It's such a beautiful part of this. Because God isn't gone. God's not gone. But from there, you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. Isn't it beautiful that even in our failings, God's still faithful. If you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. And then he goes on and says, he says, when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. By the way, it's because your relationship has changed with him. You see his faithfulness, so you will obey. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. 
For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to him. Isn't that beautiful? Your relationship with God matters in the sense that you have story after story to reflect on and to share, to give all glory to God, to the people around you. I remember... Uh, in in Michigan, uh, I had this thing with uh, homeless people that would come through. They'd knock on the kitchen door, and I was the main one that could hear the door. I was close; my office was closest to the door, and I'd hear, and I'd go and I'd check. Sometimes it, it was just some someone trying to sell me something or uh, trying to solicit something in the church. Um, Mostly it was homeless people. We, had, we lived on, um, or the church was on a road that had like four or five churches, because that's America. And, and they would just hit church after church after church. And then we were the last one. So I got, I got the people that everyone said no to most of the time. I was the youth pastor there, and, uh, and so I, I didn't mind talking to them. Because like I said, I love hearing stories. And you want to know people that have stories? Homeless people have stories. In a variety, in a variety of contexts. So I, I'd actually, they, they'd go, hey, I'm really, I need money, I need food, or I need this, or I need this. And I'd go, hey, bear with me. Would you like to go back to my office? I love to hear more about you. And I got some people who are like, I ain't got time, see ya, deuces, like, I, I don't want this. And I would say, have a great day, hope you find what you're looking for, <laughs> you know. But I had a lot of them that wanted to tell somebody, they had burdens that they wanted to give to someone. And I don't know these people from Adam, so I'm like, let's talk. I'll bear your burden, it doesn't bother me. So they come into my office, I'd sit down, and, uh, and we'd talk, but I would say, tell me, this, sit down, introduce myself, tell me your story, I want to know your story. And they would start in on a sob story, like the reasons why they needed the money. And I would have to interrupt them, and I'd listen for a bit, but I'd have to interrupt them and go, no, I want to know where you're from. What got you from there to hear. I want to know all about it. I want to spare no detail. And I've heard some that I thought were just wild stories. I had a guy that said that he got stung in the calf by a scorpion. And then like two weeks later, he shows up and he said he got like the same wound was actually a hog that like tusked him. And I'm like, all right, buddy. Like I got, and I, the same guy came back a couple weeks later and said he needed money because he needed gas money to take his pregnant wife to the hospital and I said is she here and he goes yeah she's in the truck we gotta go and I go well I said um well if she's here I go hop in my car let's let's not stop let's get to the hospital I go out there she's got her feet up (laughs) texting she isn't pregnant at all and I was like I was like are you pregnant and she goes pregnant and I was like I'll bow out you know like and I go he said it um but I would share these stories with this, with, or these people would share their story. And I would ask them, ultimately, do you know, like, have you ever gone to church? Get to the point where we could talk about God. And then here's that resonated with them the most. Because I could go through Romans Road, which I did. Because I wanted them to know from the word of God where it says that they would be saved. But I got to tell them my story and my relationship with them with God and then I and then that resonated because I don't know if you know this homeless people have a heavy community within the homeless people and they bank on relationships and so with that there was one time where a man named John I don't remember his last name he came in and he shared with me his sob story and I go please tell me your story he grew up in, uh, on the East Coast and hard life, um, moved to Kentucky where his dad 
I think it was Kentucky, where his dad was in a coal mine, worked in a coal mine. His dad passed away. Him and his mom moved back to South Carolina, and ultimately he gets married, and he has two sons. And he said, by no one's fault but my own, she divorced me and took the boys, and they felt rejected and neglected by me. And he said, so I moved out here in Mid- to Michigan with my brother. And then my brother didn't want to have anything to do with me, and he moved. And I'm living with a friend right now, in and out, on the, on the street. And his only mode of transportation was a bike. And I said, well, John, um, I'm sorry to hear all of those things. What a hard life. And I go, what, what about your sons now? And he goes, they, they don't like me. I go, when was the last time you talked to your sons? And it had been years, years. At this point, his sons, he said his sons have families of their own. He hadn't talked to them in years. So I share the gospel with him. And that day, he professes faith in Christ. And he says, I'll see you Sunday. Now, I don't know if you, any of you have ex- ever experienced this, but when you hear those words, it usually doesn't happen. Just being honest. I hear people say, oh, that, give me the money. I'll see you Sunday. John showed up that Sunday. And when he showed up, I'm doing other things. I have a million, like, things that I'm doing, wear, wore many hats there. And, I'm, and he shows up, and I go, John. And I go up there, and I was like, you came? And he goes, yeah, I told you I'd come. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. He came that Sunday. He came the following Sunday. And then the third Sunday, he didn't show up. Rides his bike up to, um, to the church on, during the weekday. He comes and sees me, and he said, I'm so sorry, Miss Church. He goes, I had a doctor's appointment. And he goes, I actually have another doctor's appointment right now. And I go, do you need a ride? So I take him there. And then the following Sunday, he's not at church. He comes and knocks on the door. And he looked different. He is dressed nicer. He, his posture had changed. And I said, I said, hey, man, you're looking good. What's up? And he goes, well, I want to let you know I won't be coming to church anymore. And I go, well, that's a bummer. And he goes, I actually called my son. And he forgave me. I'm going to live with him. I was like, John, what great news. And he goes, I know. He goes, my family saved over there. I told them that I met with you and got saved. And he said, I want you to live with me. You have a story to tell. Your relationship with God isn't just for you. That's what I found out that day. How beautiful is that? Reconciliation with God leads to reconciliation with a long-lost son. God working through obedience. God working through his faithfulness. God working through his love and his kindness. His mercy. All because of a story. I told him that day, I said, tell other people your story. You have quiet a story. It goes on here because this is why, and this matters. So as I charged him to say this, to tell his story, verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God, check this out, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. In it, I love this because it goes from fear the Lord to love the Lord. Out of fear, we love And out of love, we fear. They go hand in hand. The more I love God and the more I get to know him, the more I see the position that he needs to be in my life, and I will inevitably give him everything. It's not that I'm checklist Christianity and I do all of these things a certain way to gain favor with God or to gain any... any, it's, It's his love on me, And then I reciprocate the love out of adoration and exaltation of his name. And with it, I give everything to him. Can I say that's hard? 
That's really hard, but praise God. In, in chapter 4, we see that he is a merciful God and still faithful in our mess-ups. But we strive for it. We pursue God with everything we have after salvation. That's what James talks about. We're saved under good works. Working out our salvation. This, I'm a new creature saved by Christ, and now i got to give him everything because I owe him everything. I bring nothing to the table. Everything I have is of him. So give it to him anyway. Point number three. Recount your story with God. So we have to have an understanding of our history with God, and we have to have an understanding of our relationship with God to understand verse 6 here. This is the basis of moving forward in this process. After he says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That's our exhortation. He says, your posture needs to be this. And these words I commanded you today shall be on your heart. In verse, in verse 6, or in verse 7, when it goes on to say, you shall teach them diligently to your children, there has to be an understanding that you are following God so hard that not only are your words said, but your actions follow it up. I see so many times, and I don't know if you've seen this in our day currently, Millennials and Gen Zers are the fastest growing belief is non-affiliated. That's the fastest growing belief is actually to not believe. Apathy is on the rise. And if you haven't heard of the deconstructive movement, it is flourishing. If you're on any sort of social media platform, if you do just hashtag deconstruction, you will read thousands upon thousands of stories of someone growing up in the church and then deconstructing their faith to believe nothing or to live a la carte Christianity. I like this, but this part makes me feel bad, so I'm going to throw that to the side, but I'll keep this. And I can't help but think biblically that the generation before could have said in words only and not in deeds, or did deeds and not words. They go hand in hand. But you have to have a posture right with God if you're going to point people towards him. Can't be the blind leading the blind. On your heart, parents, parents, you can't by happenstance hope that your child gets that comes to know Christ. Yes, is it a work of Christ? Absolutely, it's a work of Christ. But you have a job in this. After they get saved, you can build on their faith with your stories, with the history God's had with you. Because when they fail, and they will, they need to know God's still merciful in their life. God needs to know that he's still faithful in their life, that it isn't like this God that's sitting up there with a rod going, I'm waiting for you to mess up. But he's also got a staff, and they both comfort us. That he pulls us back into himself when we're prone to wander. And he comes, he goes, come to me. That's the posture of your heart that you share with your children. You've gone through it. I'm 37 years old. I hope I have a lot of life left in me. But at 37, I've gone through enough that I can tell people about the faithfulness of God, especially my children. That I can be the one, because I've seen Christ work, be the one that when they're doing something, that Christ is moving in their life, that I could go, did you see God right there? That right there, that's one of my favorite things to do with people, is when they're doing something for the Lord, using a gift God's given them, that I go, did, did you see that? You see God moving in you? you? It shall be on your heart. He goes on, and this is our command. This is passing on generational 
belief. And then you shall teach them diligently to your children. So he starts this off by, by saying, your job. My, now, in the context of the, of the Hebrew tradition, we saw families, whole families living together in community. In fact, everybody would mostly be related either through marriage or what in, in, a, in the context of a, a plot of land. So this command was that the community would teach the children faith in the Lord. All of the history that has happened and how God was still with them. Why do we have a, a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night? They need to know. What are the instructions of obedience to God? What does a relationship look like with God? These are diligent things, intentional things. This isn't happening. This is where this can happen. We will treat parents, and I'll put myself in there, pastor, okay? I'll put myself in this position because so often this can happen where we will delegate topics of faith in Christ like we delegate sports. I'm not good at soccer, so I'm going to take my kid to Ken and Kofke and let him teach my son soccer. You're not afforded to be bad at Christianity. You got to learn. In all understanding, the Bible says, love the Lord your God and all understanding. With this, we, we have to have the idea that we cannot delegate this. As your pastor, I get to see your children and your teens. Children, I get to see one hour a week. Your teens, I get to see at most two, two and a half hours a week. You get to see your teens and kids all the time. Imagine if you made intentional, intentional, work in discipling your children and the knowledge and understanding of God. How their faith would, be, would grow in him. The understanding of pursuit in him. Grandparents, when you have that opportunity to take an intentional, an intentional um, relationship and investment in, in these children, what it could look like. Don't delegate it. Don't delegate it. This is the call that, that you should teach them diligently to your children. And these are, the, these are the areas of life in which you should teach. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Talking about God and the faithfulness all the time and his faithfulness all the time. All the time. I like to ask people, what do you talk about the most? What comes out of your, like, I love the NBA, and you're going to hear me talk about the NBA a lot. And if you never heard me talk about God, as a pastor, you'd be like, who's this guy? We have to. We don't have a choice. It can't just be about politics, the weather, our hobbies. It, God's in it all. And so if, if that's the case, we got to talk about him. With our children, my wife does such a great job. Well, she was in here, so I get brownie points on this one. But she's downstairs teaching the children, so I'll tell her later. My wife does such a good job when we're outside and she sees something, like, and they'll catch a frog, and she goes, who created that frog? Look at this. And you get to enjoy that frog. Do you know God created this for you to enjoy? It's not about the frog. It's not even about our enjoyment. In it. It's about God and his glory that he created this. And we get to have fun with it. Praise him. How often do you talk about him? If we're called to talk about him in every aspect of our life, how often do you do it? It goes on to say the last two verses here. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. They had 
um, full, what they called phylacteries, which were these boxes or pieces of leather that would, they would wrap around their arms with um, the Shema on them. Uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And they would put it to their forehead and they would say that in the morning. It became, in, in Jesus' day, it became so crazy that they would make these incredible boxes with all of these leather straps in them as like means of like, it's, it's for the person that carries the really thick Bible into church. It's like, I know. It, that's kind of where they were at. They, it was like, so they could see how great their, I really love God and he really loves me. So it's not that. It's just, it's this reminder that God is faithful and he should be on that routine. Not only that, but your identity as a community should be this. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates when someone comes into your house. When, when the children are in your house, they should know that this is a house meant for the glory of God. So the goal here is to teach our children our history and our relationship with God. In Psalm 78, we see this played out again. I want to read this with you. If you want to turn there, you can. And then I'll end. We're just going to read through verse 8. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. We do not want to create a generation of fathers like that. So let's share our story. If you're sitting here today and you're like, what is this story? I want to share with you, I'll close with this. I want to share with you my story. Some of you know, some of you don't know. Teens, you're going to hear this again this coming Wednesday, so Merry Christmas. I grew up in a church that, um, just down the road, preached the gospel. Preached the gospel. I, I lived in a family that had Bible studies in the house. The doors were open. I was, we were at the church. That was our routine. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. And so it was really easy for me to say the line when someone said, when did you get saved? I would say, well, I always believed. Well, that's it. Not biblical. Just so you know, if you're sitting here, you're like, I've always believed. They're, you're born a sinner. You can't always believe. The Bible says your good works are as filthy rags to God. No one does good, and no one pursues God. So there has to come a point where he saves you, and then your relationship with him has changed. I didn't know. Growing up, I went to this church, and, and I'm sure I heard the gospel, but it never clicked. The, I believe that the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, and it just didn't happen for me as a kid. I went to the altar, but I didn't know. And I know that because as I grew up, my thing was what we would call moralism. I wanted to be known as good, and if I could be a good kid, that was enough to get me into heaven. As long as I was a good guy. If my teachers thought I was a good guy, if my friends thought I was a good guy... In fact, it was in fifth grade, I had a teacher, Mrs. Karen Wright, who 
uh, said t- in front of a where evening church, we're sitting in there, and she stands up and she goes, I want to brag on Jason for a bit. Fifth grade. He is a good kid. And I can believe anything he says. And I go, really? Harmless compliment led to a realization that if I could figure out a way that you, even if it was false, if I could find a way that you thought I was good, I was good. Eighth grade. So I lived like this, and it was... Good works. I'd hold, I was that Midwestern hold the door open for the person on the other end of the parking lot going, take your time. You know, like I was that guy and I could pat myself on the back. I could go home. But I knew in my heart that it, something was wrong. What a pressure to carry, by the way, that if you believe your good works is what gets you into heaven. Man, what a pressure that you put on yourself. I felt it. Eighth grade, I was at a summer camp and there was a guy Um, a pastor gets up there and he shares the gospel. He says this. He says, some of you in here are, are believing that if you go to church, you're a Christian. Can I tell you, going to church doesn't make you a Christian as being in a garage doesn't make you a car. It doesn't work. You could affiliate yourself with something, but it doesn't make you a Christian. You could do all of these good things, But it doesn't matter, because if you get to heaven and put the balance there, your bad works will always take take over the good. Because you were born a sinner in need of a Savior. The only way to get to heaven is a perfect life. Perfect life. Perfect life according to the will of God, which is found. You just read the Old Testament, you'll find it. The Ten Commandments alone will tell you that you did not love God and you did not love people. No one had to teach you to sin. That's what he said. No one had to teach you to sin. You lied out of self-preservation on your own and therefore broke God's law, which made you ineligible for a relationship with God and a place in heaven. He, goes, he said, it can't be of your works, because Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, not is by faith through grace alone. Grace through faith alone. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Can't be about you. He said, but the beauty is this. And he walked through Romans, the book of Romans. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You cannot get there on your own. You have sinned. And nothing you can do can redeem that. The wages of sin is death, which means your sin leads to death. That you get paid death. What a, what a gift. Or what a, what a wage there. And then he says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Why Jesus? Well, Jesus came and he did the thing you couldn't do. He lived a perfect life. A perfect life. The thing you couldn't do. And then, the punishment you deserve, which is death, he took that. He didn't didn't deserve that. But for God so loved the world that he gave his son. He willingly goes to the cross, taking the weight of sin upon himself, the wrath of God that we deserve on himself. And then he rises on the third day that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What happens is we get the perfect life we didn't live, that Jesus lived, and he takes the wrath of God that you deserve. He takes the wrath of all the good works you're banking on, all of the good things you're banking on, all of the other things you're banking on. He took all that wrath so that by trusting in him, You have a perfect relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And you get heaven when you die. And he goes, is that you? Yep. I'm sitting there in in a seat, and I'm like, wait, I don't have to work for this? I don't have to do anything to get this? The pressure that was off my shoulders in that moment. I went forward and got saved that day. I professed my faith in Christ, and I've been banking on that ever since.
not me. Guys, I, I was serious when I said it's the grace of God that I'm here today. I deserve death. Jesus is better. I want to share that with you because you may be sitting here and going, that's not me. Can I encourage you to talk to someone? Someone that invited you here today, talk to myself. I would love to introduce you to Jesus so that you have a story to tell and you could share it to someone else who doesn't know him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your grace. I'm so, so thankful that you are faithful and merciful in my failings. But God, help it to be a reminder for us that we are saved from something for something. And that for something is to share your gospel and the story of salvation to anyone that would hear it. That would, be, that would be all to your glory. I pray that for our children and for these grandchildren, that God, you would raise up a faithful church to share the gospel and share of your faithfulness to a, a nation that is, is so deceitful and confusing and um, a nation of children destined for your wrath and desperately need you. I pray that you would just use us as ambassadors of Christ to share your truth, that they would rely on that for salvation and for a stability that can only be found in you. And we love you, and we're thankful again for everything you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No, I'm not Pastor Mark. <laughs>